the policies are extended. Because the idea of having sunset clause is sometimes in order to get the mechanism. But sometimes it's also introduced because the thought is, once you have it for a certain amount of time, maybe it will no longer be required. Um, but where the time has run, <laughs> run its course, it becomes evident that they're still required. Right? So sometimes it, it's, um, it's what's first attempted, but then they, they are extended. Um, but yeah, I mean, theoretically, they should just be temporary, right? Because the idea is that they would cultivate, you know, a change in society and women's ambitions, and they wouldn't be needed. Um, the interesting thing in, in the parity discussion in France, though, was that parity is not a quota. This is what the, the campaigners argued. Because quotas are special measures for minorities. It's very, yeah, mixed into the racist you know, history here, too. But it's about the equal sharing of political power, which makes it something very, very different. And so they could argue that, in fact, that parity did not violate the Republican principle of universalism. It actually gave two sexes to the universal citizen. Um, and so it became a type of argument that was possible to reconcile with a citizenship model that doesn't allow qu quota. Um, and I, I think this is quite interesting how the parity discussion has, has diffused around the world because the idea of, of parity is truly this, this sharing of, of political power. And well, it, you know, um, I think you said you don't, you don't like it, it's too much. Um, but symbolically, I think it's, it's very important and also Maybe it's not enough because women are 52% of the world's population. We should be asking for more rather than, than less of this. But symbolically, it can be very important. And, and one of the cases I've been studying very carefully is, is France. Um, and to get to the question about other types of, of quotas, what's happened in France um, is that the parity discussion in politics has spilled over into its discussion of gender parity in other areas. So they reformed the Constitution again <laughs> to allow for quotas for women on corporate boards. Um, they have now discussed introducing um, quotas or, or parity for university professors, because most of us are stuck at the researcher and entry positions. We don't get those positions uh, up higher. Um, Sweden also did this. They have uh, had quotas for university professors that finally allow women to, to reach uh, higher, higher positions, um, and I, the reason I would argue this has diffused across spheres in in, um, in France is because it was about citizenship. It wasn't just about po political equality, and so I think symbolically, while I think you know, in technical terms, parity is just a fifty percent quota, I think symbolically it has the potential to be a lot more, um, and it says a lot about the values of of the political system. You know, men and women working together. Um, in order to do that. And when we really think about it, you know, most countries have millions of people, and you know, it's, I think it is, it's quite doable to, to get 50% women. Um, to connect to that question about why parity in Latin America, I, I find there's also a very interesting dynamic here, because um, two of the other countries, Bolivia and, and Ecuador, also had huge problems with violence against women in politics. Um, and what, what has happened, quite interestingly, is that, so they have a quota, so in Bolivia is also one of my favorite cases here. They had a 30% gender quota. So in the first election, the way the parties tried to get out of implementing it, is that they introduced um, typos, where they made men's names feminine, Oh, we accidentally listen to him, yeah, as Emilia, as an Emilio, you know. And um, I mean, it really takes incredible creativity to do that, right? So that is, I mean, wide scale electoral fraud, right? But there was a huge discussion afterwards, like, what, you know, what, what's wrong here, right? Okay, so then they said, all right, no spelling mistakes allowed. <laughs> And then the next time, what you see is that with the proprietario suplente system, women are the proprietario, the men, and it's, they don't agree to leave willingly. They are threatened, they are harassed, their families 
you know, kidnapped, they are sexually assaulted um, to leave their position, in addition to also to take uh, decisions against their will, right? So basically make this job so intolerable that you leave, right, as Bolivia. Um, and so this also led to a discussion, like, you know, <laughs> I mean, this affects electoral integrity. I mean, you know, in a democratic life country. Um, and so, you know, again, there's this you know, new discussion about this. And so what we see is the increase to parity and the violence against women in politics legislation passed at the same time. So it's this kind of situation of 30% quota, you know, which is a step forward, <laughs> two steps forward. Then the you know backlash is step back, and now it's you know, two steps forward again. And so I think in Ecuador, similarly, there was also an effort to get violence against women legislation. And so, and Costa Rica as well has been discussed. And so I think there is a connection in my mind between trying to get women in, getting such a, a backlash of resistance, and then this sort of kind of back and forth discussion. And I, I think it's quite interesting that this has been had so openly in these countries in a way. We don't see in other places in the world, although these types of dynamics exist, exist there as well. Um, on the issue of other groups, um, this is, very, uh, very interesting. Um, some of the some of the work this gets to your fifty percent question too. Um, is what what people have found. And Melanie Hughes has found, for example, with the gender quota, the women who tend to benefit from it are women from a majority group. If you have a minority quota, it benefits men um, from the minority group. But where you have quotas for women and minorities that's where minority women are more likely to be elected. And so what seems important is uh, to have mechanisms for both groups that can be overlapping. Um, when I was in Egypt, it's quite interesting. Their new constitution has an article which says, uh, the new electoral system must guarantee women's representation. Uh, but there's another article that says it must also try, <laughs> endeavor to promote the representation of um, young people, disabled, Christians, um, workers, peasants, and Egyptians living abroad. There had previously been a quota for workers and peasants, so this makes sense. But um, for the local level, they, they so those don't mention the number. For the local level, though, it says 25% of seats are reserved for women, 25% of seats reserved for youth. At least 50% for workers and peasants. So that, <laughs> which is interesting. So like, oh, okay, like math here, but if, exactly, exactly. So one of the problems is how, how, how do you do that? And I think this comes together with the work, you know, feminist theory. Um, and critical race theory on intersectionality. I mean, we need to recognize people have multiple, multiple identities, right? There's young women, there's young Christian, disabled women, etc. And um, unfortunately, many groups are disadvantaged. So I think Hughes's work suggests that mechanisms for multiple groups that could be overlapping could could have beneficial results for increasing the, the diversity of, of legislatures. Um, but also, just really, just one final thing that was about um, the UK. So uh, one of my graduate students has found some interesting data where um, the Labour Party is now re uh, reporting the percentage of women, um, black and minority ethnic youth and gay and lesbian candidates of uh, people who apply for the initial to be considered as candidates, who get to the long list of candidates, who comes to the list of candidates, and who's ultimately selected. And it's quite interesting that in um, seats that are not for women, not subject to the gender quota. Um, there's, you know, when you compare um, the race, is that there's always, you know, a black and minority the candidate in the application, long list, short list, and then they're very rarely selected. But in the all women short list seats, there's fewer black women, for example, will apply, um, continue, but then they're much more likely to be selected as a candidate. So which suggests that even though there's only an official quota for women in the Labour Party, that seems to be the way that um, minority ethnic candidates are being selected, which suggests to us that there might be something different about 
the quota seats because maybe there's more ethos of representation and paying attention to need to have diverse candidates. That could also be um, to contribute more generally. Whereas where quotas don't apply, people you know check the box by having a, a you know a minority candidate, but then they'll never select them. So anyway, so. Hay, una, hay un tema que no preguntó Sejudo, que también ya se fue, pero está importante. Es el asunto de qué va a pasar con la reelección legislativa y las cuotas de México, con la paridad. Yo también me peleo con mis amigas. El tema de que paridad no es una cuota de 50%. Y me causa mucho dolor, porque como me gusta hacer numeritos, este asunto de que paridad significa algo distinto a cuota de 50%. Lo que sí he visto en, la, en el debate que ocurrió en México es que sí, es muy difícil argumentar contra paridad. Diciendo, ¿qué tipo de persona eres? <risa> ¿Cómo puedes argumentar? Porque con la, con, la, con la cuota de 30, 40% te podrías hacer guaje. ¿Y por qué 30? ¿Por qué no 35? ¿Y, por ¿Y quién decide eso? ¿Y, no, ¿Y por cuánto tiempo? La, te puedes hacer todo este wishy-washy. Y, y en cambio el asunto de paridad tiene este silver lining así de poder. ¿No? Está muy curioso. Eh, de hecho, cosas raras de México que a lo mejor Ramona nos podría comentar al respecto. Sí, México va a ser de los pocos países con cuota en mayoría relativa. O sea, es Francia, con México reelección. y no sé, o sea, con reelección. Sí, 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 sí. No, entonces, este. Y en Francia, as I understand it, they can pass on. Is that true? Get out of the 50%. So in France, it's not a real quota, it's not a binding. Hay una operación económica si no cumples la, la paridad. Pero bueno, en México va a entrar a reelección a partir del 2018. ¿Qué puede pasar? Yo creo que el legislador ahí sí no le pensó bien. Eh, ¿Va a haber un problema? Y no va a haber un problema. Sí va a haber un problema porque el incumbent hombre, cualquier legislador hombre que le guste la reelección, pues él va a estar libre de la cuota. Pero también alguna incumbent mujer. No. Eh, esto puede producir litigios en el futuro de, bueno, si un partido, un partido político te puede, te puede decir en el comentario, tú te voy, a, te voy a bajar porque tú quieres guapo, de ese modo. Y el otro va a decir, yo tengo derecho a buscar la reelección. Ah, tienes derecho a buscarla, pero no va a conseguir. No va a Entonces, sí, es que es cierto, eso va a pasar. Y alguien estaba discutiendo eso con un abogado. Lo que se quitó fue la prohibición. Estaba prohibido buscar la reelección. Ahora se permite buscar la reelección. No, pero el partido puede mudar, ¿verdad? El partido puede decir no, y en un pretexto muy sencillo es que es la cuota. Ahora, también hay un asunto aritmético de si va a alcanzar o no va a alcanzar. Sí va a alcanzar, pero, pero en el límite sí habría un problema. Pensemos, en la medida que la mayoría de los incumbents sean hombres, en esa medida la mayoría de las mujeres y candidatas van a estar en un distrito más o menos débil. No, es como que así es. Hoy, hoy, en hay, hoy, en hay, hoy en día hay como hoy en día hay como 230 diputados hombres y como 70 mujeres o algo así, ya no me acuerdo. Son, son 30%. Son 30 sí, son como 100 hombres, 100 mujeres, 200 hombres. Imagínate que buscan la reelección. Pues ya tienes el, el main comments y el bandage. Ahora. Como la cuota, como la paridad aplica por partido, esto solo sería un problema si un partido político llegara a tener más de 150 hombres en común. Y ni el PRI, o sea, el PRI tiene 180 diputados, que son como 60 mujeres y 120 hombres. Entonces, si estos estuvieran buscando reelección, al PRI le falta buscar otros 30 hombres y como otras 80 mujeres. Pero sí va a haber, digo, esto ya ocurre cuando la cuota estaba en 30 y 40%. Eh, este, este asunto de que la mayoría de las mujeres están en distritos perdedores, pues puede deberse a la cuota. Es como de, ¿no? Me obligas a hacerlo, pues lo voy a poner, voy a ponerla donde no haya problema. Ahora, sobre el tema de pro y contra la cuota, a, a mí algo que sí me gusta del tema de paridad es que sí obliga a los partidos a cambiar sus, sus estrategias de reclutamiento de candidatos. O sea, una cuota de 30% la puedo cubrir mandándolas a perder. Pero dar por perdidos la mitad de los distritos, eso es pan y free, no, no, no es tan fácil. Y eso los obliga, creo que por primera vez, o más fuerte que antes, 
a tomarse en serio el recruiting. Y creo que eso es muy curioso. Y a ver qué pasa. Eh, we shall see. We shall see. No sé. Yo le quisiera preguntar a Mona qué onda con las cuotas en mayores en Ya, Sí, ya. Este. ¿Quieres decir algo? Ya nos dijeron que no podemos hablar. ¿Hay un último comentario? There, as far as I know, there's not that much work um, from the voter perspective. What is interesting, um, Jennifer Lawless and Catherine Pearson looked at um, experience of female incumbents when it came to being reselected. So they found that in the United States, female incumbents, when they went through the primary system again, were much more likely to face opponents. Exactly. So, um, you know, whereas male comments seem to have an easier way, you know, road to being selected, there's much more of a challenge to women, um, regardless of how good <laughs> how good they are, which is either you know parties doing that or people feeling that maybe women are more vulnerable. I'm not really sure, but the data is quite interesting about the primaries as as being as being the root there. Uh, I should also say there's some interesting work on just the voter bias, um, party bias question. Uh, there was this study of uh, uh, in Turkey where um, it was an experimental design, but they um, had the same speech was treated, you know, one to a male, one to a female, um, and also given a party designation. Um, and what they found is that the um, participants in the experiment almost invariably judged the speech to be less good if it was attributed to a woman. Right, so they would always judge female candidates more more harshly. But when the person was from the same party as was attributed to the female, like you know, they were asked, you know, do you think this is a good candidate or not? And then would you vote for them? If they were from the same party, even if they thought it was not a good candidate, they would still vote for that woman. Which suggests so that's a separate question for how you judge the speech versus how you vote. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's a question about who yeah, so even though women were found to be less good candidates across the board, if it was a woman in your party, basically your party loyalty trumps what you think, trumps your gender bias. So there can still be gender bias in the population, but that doesn't transform into an electoral penalty against parties who nominate women. And I think that is an important point here because um, it's really, when we think about how voters operate, you know, are you not going to vote for this candidate who is from your party just because she's a woman? In most countries, party loyalty is pretty important. Which I mean, you really have to have a lot to just want to choose the man from the opposition party. I mean, seriously, right? Um, just because he's a man. And I think that this is where the voter bias versus party bias becomes very important because part voters can be loyal to parties, so therefore it really is in the hands of parties to put women in those districts. They, they, manage, they manage these patterns in a very heavy, heavy handed way. So anyways, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come.